Maggie Lena Walker was born Maggie Lena Draper in Richmond, Virginia in 1883. Her mother, Elizabeth Draper, was a formerly enslaved and the assistant cook for Elizabeth Van Lu, an abolitionist on whose estate Walker was born. Her mother later married William Mitchell, who worked as a butler at the estate and later the head waiter at one of Richmond's best hotels. In 1870, the Mitchells had a child, Maggie's half-brother named Johnny. The family has enjoyed modest financial security until William Mitchell died in 1876. His death had left the family in poverty. To make ends meet, Elizabeth began a laundry business, which Maggie assisted by delivering clean laundry to white patrons. It was during this time that she first developed an awareness of the gap between the quality of life for white people and black people in the United States, a gap that she would soon devote her life to narrate. In her teens, Maggie attended the Lancaster School and later the Richmond Colored Normal School, both institutions declared to the education of African Americans. She also joined the Independent Order of St. Luke, a fraternal organization dedicated to the advancement of African Americans in both financial and social studies. The Richmond Normal School also trained teachers and approximately joined other students to protest the city's policy of holding separate graduation ceremonies for white and black students. They argued, end quote, our parents pay taxes just the same as you white folks. Within a few months, Maggie completed her training and became a teacher at one of the African American schools in the city. Maggie worked as a teacher until 1886, when she married Armistead Walker Jr., a brick contractor, and was forced to leave her job because the Richmond School District did not permit married women to teach. By then, reconstruction had been over a decade. Without reconstruction governments in place to protect the rights of Southern blacks, a new brand of segregation and discrimination was reestablishing white control, known as Jim Crow. It was imposed by laws, customs, and threats that narrowed nearly every aspect of African American lives. In the face of Jim Crow, African Americans had to figure out how to stay safe, support themselves, educate their children, and fight for their rights. Some people brought legal suits in court. Some wrote books and editorials. Some left the South to have better lives in the North or West. But most, including Maggie, decided to stay and sought the power of the community and self-reliance. Maggie's communities were the historic Richmond First African Baptist Church and the Independent Order of St. Luke, where she committed to after she left her teaching job, and then led for many years. There is always strength and security in numbers, but for African Americans in Richmond, the group cohesion offered by the order was important because of what was happening around them. Richmond's white leaders were building memorials to Confederate leaders along Monument Avenue. The monuments kept the value of the Old South in the foreground of the city's life. They also reinforced racial bias and justified Jim Crow. For Richmond's African Americans, nearly 40% of the city's population, many of whom lived within the past of the monuments, the lost cause meant increasingly difficult lives and discriminatory, abusive environment. The order offered a way for African Americans to find strength by banding together. Maggie spoke to black audiences around the country, using biblical references to describe what progress could look like. In 1901, she announced a plan to start projects that would expand the order's reach and provide important services to African Americans. She started a newspaper called the St. Luke Herald, to spread the word about the order and speak out against racial injustice. Maggie led the order for 35 years and increased its membership from 3,400 in 1890 to more than 70,000 in 1924. Like many black women at the time, Maggie had worked in domestic service and teaching. However, she had connections and capital to become a savvy businesswoman. In 1903, she started the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank, becoming the first African-American woman to start a bank in the United States, and the first to serve as a bank president. Because the bank was staffed by African-Americans, customers could manage their money without the mistreatment they had in white-run banks. In 1905, she opened a department store called the St. Luke Emporium, at the time when black women faced everyday struggles when they shopped in white-owned stores. The Emporium was a welcome relief. Like the bank, it gave people a way to do everyday activities without facing racial prejudice. All the institutions employed and served local black residents in Jackson Ward, 
the center of Richmond's black business and social life. In 1921, Maggie ran for the seat of superintendent of public instruction on the Republican ticket, though she was defeated along with other black candidates. However, her work for the order was a meeting with much more favorable results. In 1924, under her continuing leadership, the bank served a membership of more than 50,000 and 1,500 local chapters. Additionally, she managed to keep the bank alive during the Great Depression, even though many were failing by merging it with two banks in 1929. For the last few years of her life, Maggie was confined to a wheelchair and continued to suffer from her diabetic condition. And on December 15, 1934, at the age of 70, Maggie Lena Walker died from complications of the disease. She was buried in Evergreen Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. In 1979, her home on East Leah Street in the Jackson Ward neighborhood of Richmond, known as the Harlem of the South, was purchased by the National Park Service. It became a National Historic Site. In 1938, there was a school that was named after her called Maggie L. Walker High School. It was considered as the largest African-American school in the state of Virginia. It also had several famous alumni that graduated from there, including civil rights lawyer and politician Henry Marsh, pro tennis player Arthur Ashe, pro football Hall of Famer William Lanier, and NBA legend Bob Dentridge. In 1991, the school was converted into a magnetic public school called the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School for Government and International Studies. In 2017, as Americans debated the future of Confederate memorials, a bronze statue of Maggie Walker was unveiled in Jackson Ward. The legendary legacy of Maggie Lena Walker still lives on to this day. Thank you.